Okay, good morning. Welcome for yoga. This morning, I want us to have a period of sitting and settling in, and then I'm going to discuss something during the meditation. It's related to the five states of mind that yoga suggests we are vacillating between at any one time until we arrive at the lucid mind state, and hopefully we get to stay there. Of course, that's relatively rare uh, that we abide there until we reach a certain level of development or awakening, but it is the recommended mind state, the five states of mind. Let's begin with a quiet, comfortable seat and rest your hands in your lap. You're welcome to close your eyes. As you first arrive for this meditation, Use your senses as your GPS to help you get grounded, to be more present and more stable. Without having to change anything in your environment nor with your senses, just acknowledge the experience your eyes are having for the light, perhaps the light against your eyelids. And see if you might notice that experience of light without categorizing it as either pleasant nor non-pleasant, but simply as it is. And then coming to the sense of smell, noticing any fragrance or the absence of fragrance in your environment. And again, observing that without categorizing neither for the pleasant nor the non-pleasant. And then to the sense of taste, whatever taste is on the tongue, and also observing that without deciding pleasant nor non-pleasant, but simply what is. And see if you may now do the same with sound. So hearing whatever is in the arena of sound and the silence that is holding that sound and listen without categorizing neither pleasant nor non-pleasant. And then the same attention for the body, for the the fifth sense of touch. You could notice sensations where you're connected to the ground or where your clothing is touching your skin. Or any sensation of the body, outer or inner. And also observe that, not deciding that one is pleasant and another sensation is non-pleasant. And using each of the senses like this, as if you're going through maybe like a switchboard or a circuit to arrive at everything at the now gathered in the present, 
Allow your breathing to deepen, to drop down into your seat. And with your senses now turning inward, imagine the breath starting at the pelvic floor and rising gradually upwards while expanding concentrically. And the inhale reach up to the heart, including the back and the front of the heart, the sides of the chest and the collarbone. It doesn't need to be a huge inhale, but can you gradually lift the breath from the base, gathering slowly, slowly upwards to the heart? And during the exhale, you wanna to gently tone the pelvic floor and draw that tone up as if it were like a zipper coming from the pubic bone up towards your solar plexus, but without collapsing the chest or the heart down. So there's no downward pressure for the exhale. And as you practice, <clears throat> as you practice this, notice like, the quality of your mind giving attention to the invitation of the breath. Is your mind more focused or one pointed? Maybe more dull, lethargic? Perhaps your mind is its average state of distraction. You have to keep bringing it back. Depending on the experience you've had for the morning or the weekend, maybe your mind is disturbed, feeling agitated. Or perhaps you've been fortunate and you're touching that which is lucid. You may also, as a yogi, act like a scientist, observing that even breath to breath, you are kind of cultivating, moving the mind towards lucid to the best of your ability. And please raise your hands to your heart. Notice the influence that also has on your mind, particularly since this is a familiar gesture for us. What happens when you bring your palms together this morning? You feel lucid or perhaps just one pointed. Maybe you're still distracted. You might still be challenged by dullness or disturbance. And yet the palms meet at the heart. And this is asking us to come into the midline to bring together left and right, past and future, neither pleasant nor non-pleasant. We come into the midline. And so we'll chant Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bunaktu, Saha Vidyang Karava Vahai, Pejasvina Vadhi Tamastu. Ma vidvesha vahai. When we say vadhi tamas tu, we're talking about the word tamas. May we move from darkness to tejas. Tejas vina vadhi tamas tu. May the lightness, may the luminosity be stronger than the darkness. And darkness means forgetfulness or ignorance in this case, or lethargy. And then we say ma vidvesha. Dvesha means hatred, resistance, aversion. So you can imagine how that causes states of disturbance. So may we overcome those and may we be moving towards the lucid. Let me just check one thing on the setting. I don't want to get an echo. Okay.
your exhale, you can bow your head to your heart. Release your hands. Please open your eyes. I've made the uh, tech adjustment pretty well. I have room for improvement, but I'm feeling accomplished. <laughs> okay, so the five states of mind, uh, some of you have heard this analogy before, but it's a useful reminder just in case you've left your lucid mind state since I last saw you and you're down in the weeds. This is the analogy I like to use. We have five states of mind, disturbed, dull, distracted, one-pointed, and lucid. Disturbed is kshipta, and disturbed is like if you have a potter's wheel going pretty fast, but a little bit unsteady because the ground underneath it is unsteady, and then you put some less than ideal clay on that potter's wheel in a haphazard manner, and you're trying to spin the wheel to make something out of it, that's a disturbed mind state. We can do so little with it. The foundation, the pace, the rhythm, the rockiness, the quality of the clay, the thoughts, for example, or the potential on that wheel, not centered, and then you're getting mud splattered about. So a disturbed mind state is not only an expense to us, it has an influence also on others, and it blocks our potential from being known to us. And sometimes it blocks that potential from being seen by others as well. That's called disturbed. It's considered the least helpful mind state for us in, in yoga because we can do the least with it. It's the most um, problematic. Dull, muta, is considered an improvement. <laughs> Dull is, is better than disturbed because disturbed is so chaotic rajasic dull is more tamasic and it's better than the chaotic rajas but dull is like that same wheel is very still the clay is sitting there but nothing is happening and there's no inspiration now sometimes dull or lethargy and apathy are the result of overactive rajas chaos the nervous system being on sympathetic dominance it may succumb to dorsal vagal so from disturbed to dull, kshita, mudha. And that actually can be, in some cases, helpful, particularly if we've learned how to sedate ourselves out of a too rajasic state, kind of take cover or have a time out. The thing is that when that becomes a pattern and we live in a dorsal vagal zone or a sympathetic zone, and then we live toggling back and forth between them, we're spending a lot of energy and missing our potential. We're also making the likelihood of those patterns repeating themselves. They become acclimatable. It's familiar to us. We may not be joyful about it, but it becomes familiar. And then the unknown, that is transformation, change, or evolution, can look really scary. The third mind state is called distracted. So disturbed, dull, distracted. Distracted is what most people are walking about within daily life. It's the average mind state of today. We could see dull and disturbed possibly in the DSM as depression and anxiety and you know other characteristics in the same regard. But distracted is so common and it's the middle of the five states of mind that it's actually considered an improvement over disturbed and dull. If you got to distracted and you're aware that you're distracted, we can work with that. So with distracted, like the wheel is spinning, the clay is there, there's a lot of potential, but the artist is distracted and can't really make much of the circumstance. Once that artist has some attention, concentration, and focus, they move to one-pointed, ekagra, and then they can be like a potter. And you know, if you've ever spun pottery and you first the first time you put your fingers into the clay, it's all set to go. It's like a sacred moment of giving your attention and love, and then finding out what's going to come from the clay. You know, we often say in, in Sufism and other mystical traditions, we are the clay and the hands of God, that's the potter. And I surrender as the clay and let the potter design me. Can it come through me? But to have that ekagra, that one point in focus, some artistry is possible. And then the fifth mind state is called lucid, considered the ideal place to be. And both ekagra and lucid uh, um, narodaha, these are in the ventral vagal nervous system. 
whereas distracted is still sympathetic to, to, for many people and disturbed is sympathetic and dull is dorsal vagal. But as you get to one pointed and lucid, you're coming into the zone, the ventral vagal parasympathetic nervous system, also the zone of consciousness according to yoga. So these are considered improvements. The question is, how are we going to get there? And while there are many tools to get us there, including pranayama and asana and meditation, the tool I'd like to choose today for our mental focus is neither pleasant nor non-pleasant. There's a, a mantra you could say, neti neti, not this, not that, neither this nor that, neither pleasant nor non-pleasant. Can we practice that for an hour together and feel the influence on the mind? that things are neither pleasant nor non-pleasant. This will have a powerful effect on your brain from where are you paying attention. You'll likely not be just in the basement of the lizard brain, nor in the limbic brain in the midbrain, but in the upstairs brain, the neocortex. To practice from there, your experience, the um, gift of your practice is likely to be more close to one-pointed and lucid. You are also going to be benefiting what's called your reticular activating system, which is a filtering system in your brain that filters for what you're anticipating. So if you're anticipating the day to be non-pleasant, you're going to filter for that. If we're filtering for people are criticizing me, I can easily filter for that. I can see it in your facial affect, your voice tone, the way you turn your head. I can imagine it in people talking in the street that they're talking about me. There's a criticism going on. I can see it in an email that might have otherwise been neutral, but I'm reading it as criticism. So the reticular activating system has been programmed by our anticipations. We've already done it. And that programming leads us to disturbed, dull, distracted, or one-pointed and lucid. The good news is it can be reprogrammed. And one way to reprogram it is to <laughs> quiet it down and let's not look for pleasant nor non-pleasant, but come to neutral. And then we can revive our ability to have some leadership with this reticular activating system. And that leadership might then start filtering for appreciation, curiosity, intrigue, kindness, versus like say criticism, urgency, haste, um, overwhelm, disappointment, frustration, all the things, right? So to embark, I'm gonna ask you, let me just scoot the harmonium aside. I'd like you to come onto your back we're going to start where the 7 a.m. yoga teacher training class left off. So please lie on your back with your knees bent. Take your arms out into a T-shape. And let's do the feet as wide as your yoga mat. You can start with the head facing the, the ceiling, so it's facing neutral. And then for an inhale, consider this to be the center. This is where you're going to be returning to. And with your exhale, tip both knees down to your left. And then inhale, raise both knees to center. Invite the legs to be relaxed so they are being guided by the exhale down to your right. And the abdomen is slowing down their descent. And then you'll inhale, raise to center using the transverse and oblique muscles across the abdomen and exhale down to your left. So first order of action here is to coordinate your breath and your body. And second is to sense the legs are relaxed and the abdomen is moving the legs the way that steering wheel on the boat moves the whole boat. Now as you next exhale your knees to the left, turn your nose to the right. And then inhale, knees and nose together at the center simultaneously. Exhale, knees right, nose left. Inhale to center. Exhale, knees left, nose right. Of course, at your own pace now. Notice that your nose travels less far than your knees do. 
and yet you're going to synchronize their return and their descent. The next time that your knees go to the left and your nose goes to the right, turn your right palm face down, left palm face up. And then when you come to center, turn both palms face up. The next time your knees go to the right and your nose to the left, turn your left palm down, right palm up. And continue. So your knees, your nose, and your palms, they're all synchronized by the breath. We'll do two more breath cycles. And the next time that your knees are going left and your nose is going right, go ahead and stay there. Now, I'd like you to press from your right hip through your right thigh into your right knee and actually tone the muscles of your right butt, your right hip, your right thigh. And now exhale, rotate back to center. And then exhale, tip your knees down to the right, turn your nose to the left and strengthen your left butt, lengthen through your left thigh towards its knee. The knee is still bent. And then exhale and return to center. Okay, let's unwind the body a little bit further. So one way to get to those lucid mind states is to nourish the vagus nerve, which we're doing right now. You don't have to know a lot about that, just that I'm giving you a reference for it. Now bring the legs together. So, and I'm gonna ask you to pretend that your legs are like a mermaid, you've got one leg. And so the feet are gonna work together. And that means when your knees go down to the left, you're gonna pick up, the soles of the feet are gonna come off the floor and the arch of the foot, they're gonna make like a half circle together. When you go back to the floor, both feet come down, when you go to your right, you're on the outside edge of your right foot. It's a little bit like skiing moguls, right? <laughs> Think of it if you I haven't done that in 30 years, but just imagine it's like being in your ski boots. You don't have a lot of flexibility, so the, the boots have to work together. So with your exhale, knees left, nose right. With your inhale, come to center. And then exhale, knees right, nose left, left palm down. Inhale to center. Exhale, knees left, nose right, right palm down. And at your own pace, go a few times more. When you come down with the knees in one direction, go ahead and lengthen the thighs actively. It's not passive. And the legs are joined together, so the knees also don't separate. Remember that as you're turning knees and nose opposite, they are returning to center together. So they turn and arrive at their destinations together. And then they return and arrive at the center together. Let's go once more, knees left, nose right. Stay for a bit here and activate your right outer hip, right thigh, like the right kneecap or part of a telescope. And you're lengthening it to see what is beyond your right knee. And then exhale, return to center. Keep the legs together as a unit. And now take both knees down to your right. Keep the feet, ankles, shins, knees, and thighs together and lengthen and strengthen your left hip reaching towards your left knee. And then exhale your knees and your nose to center together. Stretch your legs out, please. Come to a minute of Shavasana. I'm going to ask you just to notice like, the effect of that practice and to 
to come into this awareness with neither pleasant nor non-pleasant. Notice where your mind is between disturbed, dull, distracted, one-pointed or lucid. And how your mind is able to gaze upon all the senses and the sensations without categorizing. And then please bend one knee at a time, roll to your side and come up to table pose. And in this table pose, I'm gonna face forward so you can get a sense of the left and right. But we're gonna be doing some twisting from the midline out to one side and then to the other. So place your hands shoulder width apart. Place your knees hip distance apart and touch the big toes together. So the toes are gonna to stay connected. <laughs> the toes will stay connected. The toes will not depart each other. The toes right now are not going to be separating. The toes will stay together. And I'm saying that because I've said this at the physical studio many times in this activity, and then inevitably the toes separate. So please keep them together. And let's just test drive our system here. Can you raise your right arm out to the side and raise your left knee out to the side without jostling about left to right? and then return your left knee and your right hand at the same moment. Okay. Now, if you picked up the left knee and did that with your pelvis, so your hip went up also, and when you came back down, you probably had to jostle a little bit. We're gonna look for smooth actions. This is a cross crawl activity, really helpful for the two hemispheres of the brain. It also has a cross crawl pattern in the abdomen, and you may feel your obliques are gonna be supporting you. My hope is you feel more like connected to your midline as a result. And this is a building block practice, so give it your full attention. So we'll now test drive the other side, left arm out parallel, horizontal, and the right knee out to the side without picking up the right hip. And then can they return without jostling? Okay, so we'll inhale, right arm, left knee. Exhale, return. Inhale, left arm, right knee. Exhale, return. Inhale, right arm, left knee. Exhale, return. Of course, you're going to go at your own pace. Inhale, left arm, right knee, if that's where you are. Exhale to return. And now as you stabilize in this activity, we are gonna add movement for the head. And when you next inhale and one arm goes out to the side, take notice, which instinct do you have for turning your head? I'll recommend you turn your head away from your arm. So it's gonna go in the same direction as your knee does. You may be aware that you're having to practice some balance and core strength and coordination. Don't speed yourself up. There's no race. We aren't counting repetitions. We'll do one more time. When you complete that, then please come to Vajrasana, just a simple kneeling position. And see if you might notice any effect, the echo of the practice, how is it influencing your mind, your mind state.
we're looking for little glimpses, right, of coming towards one point that are lucid, and then we want to add our appreciation for that to be happening. So now we'll take the next version of this. You're going to come to your elbows and your knees like this, and then step your left foot out to the side and turn the left toes to point forward. And you may be already aware that you're going to sense the upper inner left thigh, or perhaps a stretch all the way down the left leg. Okay, level your hips from left to right and also keep them centered. So you should feel like you're sitting over your right hip joint directly with your right thigh and then your right knee. Okay, now turn the left forearm to go horizontal on the mat or at an angle that feels supportive to you. And as you inhale, sweep your right arm out to the side. And then inhale and twist to your right. And exhale, return back down to center. Put both elbows on the floor. Now bring the right forearm across your mat horizontally. Inhale your left arm out to the side. And then inhale and twist open to your left. Now, of course, you're going to feel how much more range of motion you have, and probably you, you have an attitude that it's more pleasant. You have a preference for the greater range of motion, but we're practicing neither pleasant nor non-pleasant. So exhale, come back down and change sides. Place the left forearm across the mat in a stable place. Inhale your right arm out to the side. And then inhale, twist to your right. And exhale, return to both elbows. And let's step the left knee in and take your right leg out. Turn your toes on your right foot to point more forward. Level your hips so you're directly over your left hip and left thigh over the left knee. Bring your right forearm across the mat in a place that feels like stability. And inhale, open your left arm parallel to the floor. And then inhale and twist to your left. And exhale, return back down. You can switch the elbows. Inhale the right arm out to the side. And then inhale, twist to your right. And see if you can do that without eliciting any sense of sort of grasping, right, for the pleasant or the non-pleasant. And then exhale, return, place your right forearm down, and we'll go one more time to the left. And then exhale, return, place your left hand under your left shoulder on the floor, right hand under the right shoulder, bring your right knee in, curl the toes under and reach into downward facing dog pose. As you stretch back to downward dog pose, it's a symmetrical pose, so you can enjoy the symmetry of it. Gaze back between your toes so your eyes are comfortably stable. And now walk your feet and hands towards each other and come into the pose called Uttanasana, the standing forward bend. With your hands to your hips, rise up to standing and come into mountain pose. And in mountain pose, we're just gonna gather to the midline and notice where your senses are. The feeling tone of your mind, disturbed, dull, distracted, one pointed or lucid. And then take a wide stance. 
Now, sometimes when a person's energy is very disturbed, and I'm not saying that's any of you, I know you're all like sattvic beings, <laughs> yeah, but when our energy gets disturbed, sometimes we don't really want to find out at that moment what the causes are. We don't want somebody to ask us, how did you get yourself so you know um, caught up or um, you know agitated? We just want to work out the yayas. We don't want to take a mental or cognitive approach. And so the next practice we're going to do here is about moving rajas, moving the energy of rajas to help it settle itself down. And that means that we're going to be making some physical effort, moving energy and trying to get it to come back down to the legs at the end of the practice. The reason that I'm saying that about the legs is that rajasic energy, if we can use the large muscles of the legs to work out that sympathetic activation, and then we can calm ourselves down, energy goes back down to the legs and the mind tends to be able to come back home to the body instead of being out there where the solutions are other oriented or possession oriented. We want to come back to this capacity we have for placing the fingers into the clay on the potter's wheel. So with this wide stance, we're going to start simply. So interlace your fingers, press down and inhale, raise up overhead. And then exhale, push out with your arms and come down to Prasara Tapalottanasana. Complete the exhale as you curl down. Now inhale, sweep your arms wide, rise up overhead. Exhale, hands down to the heart, Anjali Mudra. You can pray for equanimity. Then inhale, fingers clasped, raise forward and up. Exhale, arms wide, come forward and down and complete the exhale and the movement together. Inhale, sweep the arms wide, rise up. Exhale, hands to the heart. Clasp your fingers, inhale. And exhale smoothly, deliberately come down for a strong squeeze of the inner abdomen to release the last bits of the exhale. And then inhale one more time, rise up. Exhale, hands to the heart. Now come down to Prasara to Padottanasana, walk your hands forward so the arms will look a little bit like downward dog pose. Come up onto your fingertips, the most of your body weight is in your hips, legs, and heels. And then exhale, bend your right knee deeply, drop your body weight back into your hips and down into your right heel, not forward towards your toes or your knee. Inhale up to center. Exhale down to your left. Inhale, press into your left heel, rise to center. Exhale, come to your right, keep both heels grounded and your fingers stable. Inhale, rise to center. Exhale, go left. Inhale to center. I often think of Apollo Ono when I'm doing this activity. He was a speed skater. So you can imagine the uh, sort of graciousness and um, elegance of a speed skater with an endurance sport. <laughs> so as you're going side to side, imagine yourself in training. You're training for something here, and this training is for life off the yoga mat. The next time that you exhale down to your right, I'm going to ask you to lift your left arm parallel to the floor. And then inhale to center, return your left hand to where it started. Exhale to your left, raise your right arm parallel to the floor. And then inhale to center. Exhale, go to your right, float the left arm out to the side, parallel with the floor. Inhale to center. And exhale, go left with your hips, raise your right arm. Inhale to center. Now you'll have the option of raising both arms. So exhale down to your right. Sweep the arms parallel to the floor. Inhale back to center, fingers on the floor in front. Exhale, go to your left, sweep the arms wide. Inhale to center. 
Exhale to your right. Inhale to center. And exhale left. Inhale to center. And then let's go toe heel, toe heel until the feet come into hip distance position. Walk your hands back into the pose called Uttanasana. Inhale, glide your heart forward. And exhale for one deep bow towards your legs. Inhale, rise up slowly, raise the arms up. And exhale, hands to your heart. Acknowledge the midline. Now keeping your concentration from where you're standing at the front of your mat. If you're not there now, you can move to the front of your mat. Let's inhale. Exhale, bend both knees. Inhale, step back with your left toes. Take the arms wide. And then exhale, bring the torso upright. Inhale, raise your arms overhead. Exhale, bow forward, place your hands on your hips. Inhale, step forward. Exhale, up to standing, hands to the heart. And so breathe in. Exhale, bend your knees. Inhale, right toes back, arms wide, kind of like a karate kid moment. Exhale, bring your torso up, palms face up. Inhale, raise your arms. And exhale, bow forward, hands to your hips. Inhale, step forward. Exhale, push down to come up, hands to the heart. Breathe in. Exhale, bend your knees, the bottom half of chair pose. Inhale, left toes back. Exhale, bring your torso upright, turn your palms face up. Inhale to rise. And exhale, bow forward, hands to your hips. Inhale, step forward. Exhale, push down to come up, hands to the heart. Exhale, bend your knees. This is the last one. Inhale, right toes back, arms wide. Exhale, bring your torso up, palms face up. Inhale, raise your arms. And exhale, bow forward, hands to your hips. Inhale, step forward. Exhale, push down to come up, hands to the heart. Bring your mind into the plumb line. Okay, so here we've met rajas with rajas. So we, we might have met disturbed energy with some activating practice. Now we wanna be able to funnel that down into the legs so that a person's mind doesn't just get relief from disturbed and doesn't just arrive at distracted, it gets to move towards one pointed and ultimately towards lucid. So come onto your back with your yoga strap or you can use a bathrobe sash or the dog leash or whatever you have, come onto your back. And let's take the right foot up into the strap. If you've made a loop in the strap, if that's the kind of strap you have, so here's a loop, it's got a circle. You can take the right hand and from the shin side of the leg, put it into the loop. So don't reach from this side, but from the other side. And then use the tail of the strap to make the loop the right size for your foot and your wrist. And that means that this is going to be easier to hold on to. Open your left arm out to the side. Okay. 
Lengthen out through your left leg and your left heel on the floor. Press up into your right heel. Relax your right shoulder down towards the floor. And keeping your left hip grounded as you exhale slowly, glide your right leg out to the right. Turn your toes from like noon to 11 to 10, out towards nine o'clock. But open the right leg only as far as you can comfortably go without your pelvis tipping to the right. There's no competition. Let's keep the breath smooth. And I like to say silky. The breath ought to feel silky. Inhale, glide your right leg back up to center. Hold the strap with both hands. And breathe in. And with an exhale, curl your head and shoulders up towards your leg. And then release your foot from the strap. Roll your torso down one vertebrae at a time. Lower your head, lower your arms with the right leg straight. Lower it slowly until you're about two inches from the floor. At that place, breathe in. And then exhale, drop your leg to the ground like a little thud. Notice how your right leg feels relative to your left and try to come into that without Pleasant or non-pleasant categories. Just how does your right leg feel? And then bring your left leg up into the strap. Again, you can put your hand into the loop from the side of the loop that's you know at the shin and then reach in so that the loop may already be the right size for your wrist and your foot together. Open your right arm out to the side. Reach out through your right leg towards your heel and gently glide your left leg to whatever flexibility is appropriate for you. There's no need to compare to your former self, a future self or current self, and certainly not to anybody else in the Zoom room. And listen within your body for where that sort of sweet spot or the yes spot is. Since we're trying to encourage the mind to come towards one point and lucid and to release pleasant or non-pleasant, what you might do in deciding how deeply do I go into a yoga pose, you could ask, am I still able to have neither pleasant nor non-pleasant? Or have I crossed a threshold where I'm actually striving and clenching my teeth in some way? You're going to open out to the side. So as you go out to the left here, rotate your left toes from noon to like one o'clock, two o'clock, you know, towards three o'clock. And as you're heading out to the side, do so just as far as you can comfortably go without your right hip tipping up off the floor. So that'd be a way to determine well, how deep do I go? We could say the right hip doesn't tip up and your mind doesn't start clenching at pleasant or non-pleasant. The 
keeping the breath smooth and silky. That's another great way to know, are you still in the zone of your yoga? If the breath becomes choppy, have you left that zone? If the breath becomes dull, have you left the sort of zone of your yoga practice? Bring your leg back up to center. Reach up with both hands into your yoga strap. And as you exhale, curl your torso up. And breathing in, let's exhale, roll the torso down, release your strap, arms out to the side with your left leg straight and without any sense of hurry, come down until your leg is about two inches from the floor. Be strong and then exhale and go limp, drop your leg down. Notice the quality of your mind here. Keep observing like a, a sculptor or a potter. Connect with the sensations happening inside your body but without naming them pleasant or non-pleasant. And then please bend one knee at a time. Roll to your side. And come up to a seat. I would recommend that you have a blanket or a bolster under your hips. Doesn't have to be a big bolster or a big blanket. You don't have to sit really high up on it. I'm also gonna suggest that you have a couple of blocks nearby. And so initially, when you come into this seat, find your plumb line. Check in with each of your senses. Neither pleasant nor non-pleasant. Now, as you keep your body in the plumb line and your head's going to stay centered for the next couple breath cycles with your eyes closed, inhale and shift your gaze to the right underneath your eyelids. Exhale, glide your gaze to center. Use the whole exhale to get there and inhale, gaze to your left. Exhale, return to center. The eyes are still closed. Inhale, glide to your right. Exhale, glide to center. Take your time. A smooth glide of your eyes to center. Inhale, glide to your left. And exhale, glide to center, of course, at your body's pace. Let's do this twice more.
Now cross your left hand, the outside of your right thigh. With the eyes closed, twist to your right. And as you inhale, keeping the eyes closed, turn your gaze a little more to the right than your nose goes. And keeping your twist, exhale, relax your gaze to center. The eyelids are still closed. We'll do this three more times. So you're simply using the breath and the eyes. The rest of the twist remains stable. Follow your exhale to come back around to center. Bring your right hand across to your left knee. Twist to your left with the eyes closed. As you inhale in the twist, move your gaze to the left. As you exhale, your gaze will come back to center. And try to make the movement of the eyes Smooth, not staccato. Do that one more time, please. And then exhale and come around to center and start noticing now how we organized from the rajasic practices until we arrive here. What is the feeling tone? And we'll finish with one more physical asana before we use a uh, restorative practice. Sometimes when people are rajasic, so we'll, we'll stay with that disturbed mind that we can see. Sometimes it's coming from a history of trauma and adversity and neglect, abuse, misattunement, you know, all the things, the entire package of that. And as that is possible for millions of people, we want to understand how to address it. There's another factor that we can consider, which is as we develop, if we don't get a chance to develop at the third chakra, which is between the ages of seven and 11, to develop a sense of like agency, ingenuity, capacity, that we can do things, we can act on things. If that isn't really developed in a sovereign way, if it's always in reaction to something else, like I'm going to prove you wrong or it's in response to expectations from others. You could look at the work of um, Keegan and Kohlberg when I'm talking about this. I'll tell you more about it some other time. But if it's really in reaction to, like, I'm going to prove you wrong or I'm going to do what you expect of me, then it's not really sovereign development. So at the third chakra, sometimes that disturbed mind state is the frustration, the irritation, the feeling that you, you can't manifest that which is your purpose. You're trying to bring your dharma forward, but it keeps getting blocked by something, sort of like invisible forces or even sometimes self-sabotage. And so as that quagmire is happening, sometimes that disturbed mind state is actually a really important symptom. It tells us that somewhere we're out of alignment here at the third chakra. And there's something that we want to express and we aren't able to do it. We don't have the skills or the support or didn't get the developmental in our scaffold. So we don't have support from society in some ways or intergenerational experiences of um, suppressing or oppressing. So sometimes disturbed is a reaction to feeling held down and then wanting to express. Um, so if we think of it in that terms and we can help to coax somebody from disturbed to lucid from that place, they can look at like in a reflecting pond, 
what's been happening for me and how am I going to really resolve it? So I'm not just managing this one episode of disturbed. I'm getting to understand the matrix of disturbed inside of me. So the next pose is after we get this rajas like organized, can we bring it to an expansive lucid quality? And the next pose is for that. So take your right leg out to the side. And let me acknowledge that um, not everyone's hamstrings are expansive and lucid. And it's okay. You be you and I'll be me. I have long hamstrings and short thigh bones. You put your yoga strap so that you've got your loop over your right foot. You take the tail and just keep it available. I got a really long strap here, so keep this available. Put the right block on the outside of the right leg and the other block on the inside of the right leg. Twist to your left and begin to side bend to your right. Now, as you're walking down to the right, you might put your forearm on a block. Mine's gonna go on the floor and twist a bit to your left with the chest and the heart. And then you're gonna sense for yourself, um, do I wanna stack these blocks? And do I need the block to be on the outside of the right leg for the head or on the inside? And for me, I'm gonna take a stack like this today. I'm just exploring, is that where I want that to be? Yeah. Okay, when you get support for your head, it should feel like you're not gonna knock the blocks over and that you can actually twist your torso also to your left. You might already feel the stretch on the side waist or the inner thighs or the hips. Let's just run a little experiment. Can you take your left arm overhead? Now the right arm can press down against your block or the floor or your thigh. And that helps the twist to your left. And I'd like to add something now that gives you uh, another layer. So now that you know what your setup is, please come up and take your yoga strap. So there's a reflex. There are many reflexes in the body. And one of them associated with um, the vagus nerve and vagal tone is called the reaching reflex. We're going to add that in. That's why your strap should be not disturbing your blocks and at the ready. So hold it with your left hand and come down. And then with the strap, you're going to wrap it around your hand. So you can see I just made mine more tense by sliding it with my right hand over my left hand. So the over the strap, excuse me, so that my left hand has to press up against the strap. My right hand is what makes the strap taut. Okay, so now as you twist to your left and you press up with the left arm, the reach reflex is activated. Press down into your left hip, your right hip. Keep the right leg toned. Let's imagine that disturbance might be like a blocked ability to reach for that which you're longing for and to, to have the agency for the expression. You know, when you next inhale, release the strap from your right hand and it should slide up with you when you come and then set it down. Okay, let's go to the other side. So bring your right leg in and take your construction items with you. <laughs> okay, left leg out to the side. Go ahead and put the loop so it's gonna be in position like this. Now, if you decided that you wanted the head on the inside on the last row, Go ahead and start there and just see if it's similar enough. Put your strap so it's not going to be obstructed. Right. I'm going to store mine right there. Okay, and start just twisting to your right and side bending a little bit to your left. And as you're doing that, you may have different flexibilities left to right. I certainly do. So decide if you need your blocks to be taller to support this side. I would not recommend that you decide that you need them lower. If this is your more flexible side, make a note of it and don't encourage the more flexible side to keep getting exploited. So just check and see where you put the left arm, whether that's the floor or your thigh or a block. Can you turn your heart to the right? 
and take your yoga strap and you're going to wrap it around your right hand because that's the one that's going to be going up for the reach. And when you wrap it, raise the right arm past your ear and then put some tension on the strap with your left hand so that your right arm has to move against some resistance. You don't have to apply so much resistance that you feel blocked, right? Just give yourself a little play here. Can you reach and use that reach reflex that comes from the vagus nerve? This reach is associated with social engagement and also reaching for potential. It's not associated with grasping or craving, not in the sense that those are called raga, also known as one of the causes of suffering. This is a reflex in the polyvagal system that Stephen Porges was talking about in his research. And we need the reaching reflex to help ourselves and also society. So as you next inhale, then raise up, release the strap, and take a seat. Observe what's happening in you. And also the quality of the mind. Are you able to have that middle path between pleasant and non-pleasant? Neither is enticing you away right now. Please come onto your back with your blanket or your bolster under your knees. This is for Shavasana. I think, you know, sometimes that disturbed energy is like you're at your desk sitting so much, you're not really using the legs, sitting, 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 and working with the uh, mind and the eyes and the brain and, you know, working on things, but you're sitting in one place. <laughs> you're not actually going anywhere. You're moving things around, but you're moving them all in a mental sphere, not in the physical body. So sometimes just getting more exercise is going to help people not to have that disturbed mind state. An option here for your Shavasana is to put the blanket under your knees or your bolster under your knees, and then put your blocks under your heels. It's going to add a gentle um, inversion to your body. Another option, if you have had disturbed mind or agitated nervous system, you can take something to cover your eyes during your Shavasana. Now you're seeing me cover my eyes. That doesn't mean that I've been agitated. It means I'm demonstrating an option. It also means I still am recovering from a concussion. There's an overhead light in this room and I don't want to look at it. <laughs> so for any reason, you can decide you want to cover your eyes. Please come into Shavasana and let's just, you know, watch the medicine of the practice, nourishing ourselves. You might observe the way your body is metabolizing this practice. Your limbs may start getting heavier. At the same time, you might feel this kind of effervescence, circulation or prana moving through all four limbs.
Allow your torso to also get heavier and more deeply relaxed. Like a sense that even the organs, they drop towards the back hemisphere of the body. There's no part of your organ system that feels urgent about the future right now. Encourage the same for your senses, each of the senses, deeply relaxing. And all five senses can withdraw temporarily from any sense of pursuing the future. Deeply relax your eyes and your tongue, the middle ear, left and right, the back of your throat, the base of your skull. Invite your body and your mind to relax even more deeply now. And then once more, allow the relaxation to go a few degrees deeper.
Stay present to the relaxation of your body and your mind without mental activity. Begin to just imagine the mind reflecting, neither narrating nor commenting, neither pleasant nor non-pleasant. Now allowing the mind to remain reflective and still, please wiggle your fingers and your toes and make a thoughtful transition from Shavasana. Return to meditation. In Shavasana, we sometimes wordlessly and non-cognitively resolve a lot of tension. We can feel renewed. The resources within us getting renewed. As you come to sit now in this upright place, don't activate your doer. It's because you've got some resource in the reservoir. Don't activate your mental doer. Stay in the in your practice. Neither pleasant nor non-pleasant. Awareness is like the surface of the water Reflecting the sky, the trees, the moon, and the stars, birds, airplanes, whatever comes and goes. Rest in the stillness behind all thoughts, the silence behind all noise.
And please raise your hands to your heart. And acknowledging that we have a great benefit to have a Sangha a community and that not everybody has this opportunity for shared practice. We also want the merits of our practice to be beyond our own well-being to serve humanity. So we'll finish with a chant, Loka Samasta Suki no Bawantu, means may the whole world, Loka, have access to ease and happiness, to balance. Sama means evenness, Sukha is happiness. May the whole world have access to the attitude of Bhava, the attitude of. Really, we're saying may our practice benefit those around us and beyond our obvious reach. May the, the echo of this serve others. Loka Samasta Suki no Bawantu Loka Samasta Suki no Bawantu Thank you to everyone who's gathered for our practice. Thank you also to my teachers and my teachers' teachers. Namaste. Now, if these practices are helpful to you, of course, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Click like for the videos that help you. So I'll know, I'll get that feedback and leave comments or questions down below as well. Thank you once again.